Welcome back to another episode of the For the Property Investor podcast. And of course, um, we're here another week with the weekly news with the only man that can bring us the news, Nick Bendel. Hi, Nick. Hello, Owen. Great to join you. It's uh, always a pleasure. Um, and um, what's been happening in your week this past week, Nick? Well, I'm glad you asked. You asked. I, I am the owner the of Hunter & Scribe, which is a copywriting agency that writes content for finance and property professionals. We work with dozens of brokers throughout Australia. And that's why uh, last week on Friday, I attended the FBAA conference on the Gold Coast, which I always like to go to every year. Right. The Gold Coast or the conference? Well, a bit of both. Uh, it's always nice to catch up with my broker friends to make some yep. new friends. And there were some really good speeches this year as well. Oh, very good. Um, and um, it's. did you learn anything new while you're at the conference? Well, I, I did. There were. I, I really enjoyed the presentation from Warren Hogan, the economist. Okay. He had some interesting things to say. Uh, on different aspects of the economy. One of the things he spoke about was the dependency ratio. Uh, in other words, the uh, the number of taxpayers supporting each dependent who, who might be a child or who might be a pensioner and how uh, that had been falling, oh, sorry, that had been uh, increasing in previous decades. So in other words, for every one dependent, we'd had an increasing number of taxpayers but now that's starting to head in the opposite direction. So for every one dependent, we're having fewer taxpayers. And that's going to result potentially in uh, people having to work longer or people having to accept lower pensions. And it might also, and he also mentioned it's going to result in uh, businesses finding it harder to recruit labour. Right, okay. It's um, so. Was, was that more of a um, an increasing uh, number of dependents or or increasing number of taxpayers? Uh, that is due to our society aging, yeah, and therefore people uh, leaving the workforce. Right. So more dependents who are um, not taxpayers anymore. Exactly. Right. Okay. Cool. Interesting stuff, um, except for the people who find it dry and boring, uh, which, of course, we don't. No, and if anyone finds that sort of thing dry and boring, would they be listening to this podcast? Of course not. Of course not. Not at all. I, I like um, the way you said, of course, and then there was a slight pause, and then you remembered to add the not <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> of course not. No, it, it's called a pregnant pause for a reason. Mm. Yeah, To emphasise the not. Well, I think part of the problem with this dependency ratio is that you mentioned a pregnant pause. Maybe there hasn't been enough pregnancies. So we don't have True. enough new workers entering the workforce. Yes. And it, and it takes a good 20 years for any new pregnancies to um, uh, turn them into taxpayers. Yeah. I, so I think it's really good that we've got two men talking about pregnancy. I, I think that's really going to go down well with our female listeners. Yes. Yes. All right. Well, um, uh, when I have a um, uh, an expert series interview with um, a um, uh, a woman, I will I will bring this up, <laughs> and I'm sure that will also go down well with our female listeners. <laughs> oh, still, all right. <laughs> well, um, yes, maybe I'll just shut up and move on. Yeah. And how has your week been? Um, my week's been um, pretty good. Um, we had, um, a, a, as as you brought up last week, um, that you predicted that uh, I'll talk about end of month. Yes, we did have end of month, but it was fairly uneventful, so it wasn't too busy. Um, so uh, I broke the mould there a little bit, Nick. Um, so um, that was pretty good. But we had um, uh, a very big month for, for leasing of properties and uh, all across the country um yeah last month it was uh you know, or the previous month was uh, queensland had the biggest month of leasing um this past month was uh, new south wales so um it's 
been an interesting uh, few months and uh, coming up to the end of the year, it's um, a lot of movement happening, people trying to get in and settle before the end of the year, uh, we think. Mm, that That is interesting. And, and for those who don't know, your property management business, Leafield, you're in five states. Yes, five states, uh, biggest states being New South Wales and Queensland, but um, WA is fast growing. And then we've got um, Melbourne and Victoria and Adelaide, South Australia as well. So um, thank you for that. And it's, uh, yes, because it's the 4th of November today. Hmm. And um, that's a, um, uh, the year's almost over. It is almost over. Uh, and I've noticed that this seems to happen every year or so. Uh, every year around November, we seem to near the end of the particular year that we're in. Yes. Well, uh, it, it's, it's, I, I've always called it uh, whenever Melbourne Cup happens. It's as soon as Melbourne Cup happens, everyone realises, oh, it's almost the end of the year. And everyone keeps on putting off decisions then until next year. Yes, actually, that, that is an interesting thing. I've noticed that in my business also. I'll talk to someone and they'll say, let's uh, let's circle back in the new year. And uh, it's, it's interesting the way humans work. Uh, we tend to be procrastinators. And why do something today if we can put it off until tomorrow? Exactly, or next year. Indeed, indeed. And yet here mm. we are, like clockwork, recording these podcasts every week. Of course, and um, we and we won't stop, will we? Nothing will stop us. No, nothing will stop us. Yes. Well, uh, talking about getting started or stopping, um, we, we should start talking about the news. I thought you were going to say talking about nothing, we should start talking about the news. But talking about the opposite of nothing, let's talk about the news. We've got three stories. The first one being... Prices increasing in some cities, decreasing in others. Australia has a two-speed property market, the latest CoreLogic data has confirmed. Over the October quarter, three capital cities grew strongly, while the other five recorded either minuscule or negative growth. Perth, Perth's median property price increased 4.1% over the October quarter, Adelaide 3.7%, Brisbane 24 and then we had Sydney 0.1%, Hobart minus 0.1%, Melbourne minus 0.8%, Canberra minus 0.9%, and Darwin minus 1.3%. I would like to go into a bit of detail on about three sure. of those cities. Interestingly, Perth's quarterly growth has fallen significantly between May and October. So during those six months, the quarterly growth numbers have been 6.1, 6.4, 6.2, 5.7, and now 4.1. Do you expect Perth's quarterly growth numbers to turn negative sometime in 2025? I'm not sure about negative, but it'll certainly um, slow down a lot further. Um, it's uh, um, that, that sort of detail you, ne you never know until it happens. And uh, I and I would say even these uh, these figures of that are still in the fours per quarter uh, are, are probably um, uh, outdated and um, uh, are too high. So uh, we're really seeing a flattening off in the Perth market, and because it had had such huge increases over the past two years. Mm, okay. Let me throw Sydney at you. Sydney's quarterly growth numbers have also fallen over the past six months. 1.2%, 1.1%, 1.1%, 0.8%, 0.5%, and now 0.1%. Is the Sydney market about to experience a downturn, do you think? Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised at that. It's, um, it, it's very flat and uh, expecting it to be going backwards. Properties that are on the market now, You've got vendors under pressure to drop prices. Um, they're very reluctant because they, um, they're used to prices going up all the time. And it's very much a buyer's market in Sydney right now. Yeah, interesting. I, I wonder if we're going to see vendors holding off on selling and whether we're going to see reduction in stock, which, of course, I guess would put upward pressure on prices. 
yes, because there had, was a, um, a much increased uh, amount of stock uh, that came in for the uh, spring market. Everyone was thinking that spring might help them um, uh, get a bit of a boost in price, uh, but all, all it did was um, put uh, more supply into a already uh, pressured market. Um, and uh, when you got buyers out there who can't borrow uh, much money as much as they would like, and um, they're concerned about um, interest rates, they're concerned about where prices are going. Um, yeah, everything has hit a wall in Sydney. And if I'm talking to anyone uh, thinking of selling, uh, I'm telling them if you can wait till the um, uh, first half of next year, uh, till say um, uh, maybe second quarter, um, then we should be in a better position to know exactly what's happening with interest rates. Hopefully, we might have had one or two uh, rate cuts by then, and uh, that will um, help boost the market. Okay. Uh, finally, let me throw Melbourne at you. Melbourne has experienced negative quarterly price growth in each of the past six months. Zero, uh, minus 0 0.2, minus 0 0.6, minus 0 0.9, minus 0 0.2, minus 0 0.1, and now minus 0 0.2. When is Melbourne going to turn the corner? Oh, well, it has to at some point. It's um, it's uh, been uh, very down in the dumps for so long. Um, I mean, considering their taxes and the weather, it's like, you know, we, we, we can sort of understand. You have to um, throw the weather in there, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, you know, I am a, a born and bred Sydney person. So it's um, when you um, yeah look at the Melbourne market, it just doesn't make sense that it's been so depressed for so long and been so flat for so long. And um, yeah, so it's it's got to happen at some stage. I think the catalyst for it might be interest rate cuts. Um, so if you're looking at buying somewhere, um, yeah, my pick is um, is Melbourne. So you're saying Melbourne property prices sooner or later will have to start rising again, but Melbourne will always be a bleak place to live and inferior to Sydney. Uh, uh, sorry, do we have to point that out? <laughs> Okay, well, we've just lost a lot of Melbourne listeners. Uh, second story for today. Oh, Owen. it's a nice place to visit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, by the way, when I mentioned those things a minute ago, those weren't my opinions. I was just checking to make sure that those were your opinions. I love Melbourne. Okay, yeah. And I'm actually going to Melbourne next week for another conference. Right, okay. Well, you know, they... they... But besides sport, they have to do something else down there, don't they? Okay. Well, before we lose any more Melbourne listeners, let's move on to the next story. Inflation falls for the sixth time in seven quarters. There were two pieces of good news in the latest inflation data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. First, inflation fell from an annualised rate of 3.8% in the June quarter to 2.8% in the September quarter, bringing inflation back to within the Reserve Bank's target range of 2 to 3%. And second, inflation rose just 0.2% in quarterly terms between June and September, after rising 1% in each of the previous two quarters, suggesting the rate of price growth in the economy has dramatically slowed. Owen, can we now declare victory on inflation? Almost, I think. <laughs> It's, oh, yes, when, when those figures came out, it's like, hallelujah, hallelujah. It's um, finally, um, yes, we've made that uh, big dent and we've got it under uh, 3%. So, but it does have to remain there. You know, we, we, we do have um, uh, Christmas happening in the next three months, um, which always seems to um, uh, give a bit of a boost to inflation. Um, with a lot of spending happening uh, for the festive season. So, um, yes, I, I think the Reserve Bank is going to wait until um, we um, see that, um, uh, that, that those next official figures um, before they make any decision on interest rates. 
Mm, okay, so so that's the key point. The the RBA has been consistently saying it's not a case of it will start cutting once inflation gets within the target range. It, the RBA has made it clear that inflation needs to be sustainably within the target range. So I'm wondering, what would you do? Would you start cutting once you believed inflation was going to be sustainably within the target range? Or would you want to see several quarters worth of proof that inflation was sustainably in the target range? So in other words, would you be getting ahead of the data or would you wait for the data before cutting? Um, it's, uh, well, that's a good question. And that's, that's the balancing act that the RBA has to play. And it's, um, because it's a fine line. You, you don't want to start cutting too early and pumping more money into the economy. And, uh, you, you also don't want to, um, you know, keep a lid on the economy for too much longer. Otherwise we can, um, easily fall into recession. Um, but there, there is a lot of people hurting in this country with cost of living um, and in high interest rates. And um, but then there's a lot of people who are doing well. And so it's it's really um, having to have that balance there. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the RBA only has monetary policy, which is changing interest rates to be able to affect that. Um, across the board, and um, yes, it, it's um, we we need to keep those inflation figures um, uh, within that uh, uh, within that range of two to three percent uh, consistently on an ongoing basis. As you say, it is a balancing act, and this is why Michelle Bullock earns more than a million dollars a year. Of course, the advice that we give her, and I know she and her team listen to this podcast, our advice is free. It is, it is. Uh, we put it out there for the world and, um, and hopefully someone takes notice. And they have, of course, asked us, they have, of course, offered us million dollar salaries. And the only reason we've turned them down is we don't want to add to inflation. <laughs> Hang on. When when did this memo come through, Nick? <laughs> well, Michelle called me the other day and I told told her no on our behalf. I, I assume I did the right thing. Um, well, it's too late now. Okay, well, we, we, we might we'll, have to we'll, talk we'll, about that we'll later. We'll talk instead. afterwards, yeah. Our final story for today, government plans to tighten buy now, pay later rules. Assistant Treasurer Stephen Jones gave an address to the FBAA conference, during which he reiterated the government's plan to crack down on the buy, pay now, buy now, pay later sector. As things currently stand, buy now, pay later products are not covered by the Credit Act, because technically they're not credit products because consumers pay fees rather than interest. However, Jones said buy now, pay later looks and acts like credit, so it should be treated as such. That way, he said consumers would still be able to use buy now, pay later, but would have but would have access to more protection. The buy now, pay later industry, Owen, it says it's not a credit product and therefore should not be treated that way. The government says it is a credit product in everything but name, so it should be regulated accordingly. Who's right? Um, in this case, the government's right. It's um, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, what do they say? It must be a duck. Yeah. And it's um, yes, it, it, if anything, it's worse than a credit product. Um, the reason why younger generations have taken up um, these um, buy now, pay later um, uh, uh, credit um, products uh, have been because they didn't like uh, credit cards where um, there was high interest rates and so on. If if you looked at, and yes, if you pay off these, um, if you make the payments that you're supposed to on these products, then yes, there are no fees, um, supposedly. And um, But if you don't pay them off, then the fees that you're in that you incur are much, much higher than if you just got yourself a credit card. 
Yeah, th this is what's interesting about buy now, pay later. I guess if you're paying money to the institution, whether it's a credit card company or, or a bank or a buy now, pay later provider, if you're giving them money, I suppose it doesn't really matter whether you're giving the money in the form of interest or giving the money in the form of a fee. It is money and, uh, and it has a yep. cost, whatever you want to call it. Absolutely. So do you think that buy now, pay later providers should have to abide by responsible lending regulations? Um, yeah, ab absolutely. Because there's no limit to how many uh, how many of these buy now, pay later um, uh, products that someone can take on. And um, which means it's they, they have to um, take into account how many other products they have, how much other debt they have, and whether they can actually afford it. Um, now, yes, I still think there's a responsibility on the individual, and in the, in this case, the borrower, um, to um, uh, be able to um, you know regulate themselves. But if the rest of the industry has to be responsible for uh, the money they lend out, then why shouldn't these providers? Good point. And for those who might be wondering, I, sh I should point out Stephen Jones and the government, they're not opposed to buy now, pay later. Stephen Jones during his speech mm. said buy now, pay later was a great innovation and he thought it, it was a very useful product. Uh, he just made the point that he believes and the government believes that there should be more regulation to protect consumers. Uh, now, speaking of, uh, I mean, if borrowers are struggling to repay their home loan, they have access to hardship processes. Lenders have to offer it. Do you think buy now, pay later pro providers should have to offer similar processes to their customers? Um, it, yes, why not? It's um, it's if every other credit provider needs to, then why shouldn't they? Um, their argument might be, well, it's such a small amount, um, usually, that, that um, is being borrowed. And um, so they should be able to um, easily catch up. And But this is the problem to begin with. They don't know how many of these buy now, pay later um, repayments they have each month. And it might be killing them. Hmm. I, there's maybe a bigger discussion at play, uh, which is, on the one hand, we want the government to protect us as consumers, but on the other hand, we don't want to live in a nanny state where nanny is dictating what we can and can't do. Hmm. We, we've been speaking about responsible lending, which we both think is important, but I think we also need to have a discussion around responsible borrowing. Yes, exactly. We, we we need more education for individuals to be able to learn how to manage their own finances. Um, you know, I, I think the most important thing with responsible lending is to be able to maintain the financial viability of our banks. Uh, and this is what saved us as a country and saved our banks during the the GFC, the global financial crisis in the late 2000s, where banks in Europe and the US were going broke all over the place because they didn't have regulation in place like we do, like we do here in Australia, um, that um, maintained certain lending practices, um, uh, which kept our banks financially viable um, and healthy. And uh, that was that was all fine. Uh, since then, yes, we, we've we've um, we've we've um, taken responsibility away from individuals uh, for them to be able to uh, decide for themselves whether they're borrowing too much or not. And I think it mainly comes down to education. Mm. Well, the nanny state has decided that we have to end the podcast here. So th no, thank you. Thank you as always for your really interesting insights. Thank you, Nick. And of course, thank you for bringing the news.